Good morning. Good morning. Why don't we stand as we begin our worship on this wonderful Palm Sunday? Oh, 
it's time to greet one another this morning. church family. Uh, but he did say pray for a possible trip next month up to the town where 
When we think about how we praise the Lord, one of the ways we do that is through giving. That's why each week during our services, we take an offering. And we understand that the purpose of giving is not to get back in return. But the truth is that when we honor God by faithful giving, he says in Malachi, prove me, test me. You honor me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. So we don't give so we can get. We give because God has been faithful and we want to honor him. But when we honor him, he returns the blessing back to us. And that is one of the wonderful truths that God just showers his blessings upon us daily. We give freely because we know that we can count on our God to take care of our needs. So as the ushers come, Let's pray together that God would bless what is given. Lord, it is a joy and a delight to be able to offer back to you the first portion of what you've blessed us with. And we do know that we can trust you because you are a good and a faithful God. And Lord, we pray today that what is given, you would take it and use it for your glory. Provide for the ongoing work of ministry here through this church. And we will give you thanks for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
why don't we stand as we sing our next song? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood.
Shall we pray together? Lord, we remember the words of Peter where he reminds us that we are not redeemed by silver or gold or any such things, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And Lord, as we think of this Palm Sunday, we think of Jesus coming into Jerusalem and presenting himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it is a fresh reminder for us that so many are lost around us. Because we understand there is salvation in no other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so, Lord, may we truly remember afresh and anew our great salvation today. But may that also motivate us to tell others about your wonderful plan of salvation for them as well. Lord, we are glad that you have given us your word, and as we look at your word today, we pray that we would be changed by what we see, that we would take your truth, that we would apply it, and that it would help us to live more faithfully for you this week. So we ask for your blessing upon your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been working our way through the book of Ezekiel, looking at different highlights, spotlights in the book. And today we are going to look at a couple chapters in Ezekiel, but we're also going to tie in the events of Palm Sunday in John 11 and 12. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, we'll start out in John 12. Uh, when we think about Palm Sunday, we think about a time of great celebration. Jesus has been out spending time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and uh, everybody has been coming by the house because, remember, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and everybody's coming out to, to hear the story one more time. Lazarus, you were really dead and you're alive now. And Jesus did it. And everybody is thrilled. And as Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the crowds are gathering with him and another crowd comes out from the city to meet him. It's a time of great celebration. But it is also a time of weeping. And we will see uh, a couple times in that story where Jesus weeps. And then we're going to compare that to Ezekiel. And a time where uh, there is not weeping and a time where there is. A number of years ago, after I finished my uh, one graduate program, I took a trip to Europe. We ended up spending a week in London. And we were there for Queen Elizabeth's royal birthday. It's called the Trooping of the Colors. And they line the streets every six feet. You've got uh, one of the bobbies, the traditional policemen, and then you have a buckskin guard with their big giant bear hats and their red uh, apparel, and they line the streets on both sides and out parade all the military troops and all their finery. Out comes the royal family. And it is a great day of celebration. It's quite a spectacle to see. And that's the type of day Palm Sunday was. This is a, a, a something that everybody who was present was very hyped up. They're very excited. This is Jesus, and they are proclaiming him. Here's our Messiah. Here's the one who, who the prophets have foretold. And he even gets on a donkey and, and fulfilling the prophecies of Messiah. They say, surely this is the one. Surely this is the man who's going to set us free from the oppression of the Romans. And as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, it is the 10th of the month. Passover is always the 14th of the month. And uh, I've actually got a little chart. We passed some out in Sunday school this morning. If you like one, you can see me. But uh, showing the events of that last week of Jesus' life. They call it Passion Week. But on the Sunday, that was the day that uh, Exodus said, on the 10th day of the month, you pick out your lamb that you're going to use on Passover. You take it home, you keep it there, and then you slaughter it for Passover. But the lamb selection day was the tenth of the month. And so as Jesus comes in the city, into the city of Jerusalem on that Sunday, on that tenth day of the month, he's coming as 1 Peter 1 tells us. Uh, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, 
from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Jesus has been in Bethany, home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's about uh, a mile and a half away. And when Jesus comes to town a little bit earlier, remember that Lazarus has died and Jesus waits. He comes after Lazarus has been dead for a couple days. His disciples are saying, well, Jesus, we need to get there. Your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, Lazarus is sleeping. And they said, well, good. If he's sleeping, then he'll get better. Jesus says, no, Lazarus is dead. He says, but I'm glad for your sake that he did die so that you can see the power of God at work. And Jesus goes to the grave, John eleven thirty five, one of the favorite Bible verses to memorize, two words, Jesus wept. And here is Jesus at the grave of a dear friend. And a tear rolls down his cheek. It is a quiet grief, a subdued tear. And as we continue on, we will see later in the Palm Sunday story, Jesus cries out with great emotion. We'll get to that in a little bit. But as he's with Lazarus, it's a, a quiet tear. Jesus is not overwhelmed with sorrow because he knows what he's going to do. He had told his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. So Jesus knows as he stands there at the grave, He's going to raise Lazarus, but he still weeps because Lazarus is such a dear friend. Jesus calls Lazarus by name. Lazarus is brought back to life. And then John 12 records for us, verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So, so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And then uh, it jumps down and says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. So Jesus comes to the funeral of his friend Lazarus and has a silent tear, a silent grief. So, thinking about that idea, we're going to look back in Ezekiel 24. You can keep your thumb in John for turning back, but Ezekiel 24. Here in Ezekiel 24, we see the prophet Ezekiel is given a time where he's not to mourn outwardly, but he can have just a quiet, silent tear. Ezekiel chapter 24, we're going to start reading in verse 15. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening, my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? So I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me. Say to the house of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners, 
You will keep your turbans on your head and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. And you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, on that day a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time your mouth will be opened. You will speak with him and will no longer be silent. So you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. So what in the world is going on here? As I have said before, being a prophet of God was a very difficult calling. God often called prophets to do things we read, and we say, I can't believe God had them do that. And in this case, God says, Ezekiel, I'm going to kill your wife, but I don't want you to grieve about it. Some people try to soften this and say, well, you know, Ezekiel's wife, she was probably sick. She was probably close to death, and God just sort of let him know that she was going to die. But we see nothing about that in the text. God just says, Ezekiel, I'm going to kill your wife. Next day, his wife's dead. Speaks to the people in the morning and the evening, his wife dies. But let's remember that death is simply a separation of the body from the soul. Death is the transfer of the person to a different reality. Ezekiel's wife, like Paul says, is absent from the body and present with the Lord. So the only thing that happens is de in death is that she's no longer physically alive. But she is spiritually alive forevermore. Sometimes people who don't understand the Scriptures have no hope. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, we don't grieve like other people who have no hope because we have that strong assurance that we, we will see and be with our loved ones once again. But the idea of death is a big hurdle for many. Let's understand that Ezekiel truly loved his wife. Hopefully every husband here loves his wife in the same way. God calls her the delight of your eyes, verse 16. When Ezekiel saw his wife, his eyes would light up. Gentlemen, do you still beam with delight when you look at your wife? You should. Never forget that God would bless you with such a good woman. You say, well, how can, how can you say she's good? She puts up with you, doesn't she? She must be good. Ezekiel loved his wife, but God takes her. And God tells Ezekiel he is not to outwardly mourn for his wife. Verse 17, he could groan quietly, he could, you know, he could have a tear, but he can't go through all the outward ceremony that the Jews used. In the funeral rites of the ancient Near East, uh, the mourner would rip his clothes, he'd rend his garments, he would put on burlap, sackcloth, the King James calls it. He'd take his shoes off, he'd go around barefoot, he'd shave his head, put earth on his head. He would uh, wear a veil over the lower part of his face. He'd roll around in the dust and sit there. He would fast for a day, and then after a day of fasting, his friends would bring morning bread, the Bible calls it. Or in our wording today, comfort food. So after a day of fasting, then he'd just pull out the chocolate ice cream and just start eating the ice cream. Grieving. Uh, they would uh, have lamentation loud vocal cries of lament and grief and sorrow they would actually hire professional mourners to come and wail for them say what do you do oh i wail for people uh they 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 made mourning a great elaborate ceremony but god says ezekiel don't do any of that you can silently, silently grieve, yes, you loved your wife, but don't engage in any outward grieving. Because, as we see here, Ezekiel is a living sermon to the nation. 
You remember again, we talked back in chapter 3, Ezekiel is silent. He is mute. He cannot speak except for the times when he's delivering God's message. So they say, how you doing today, Ezekiel? Can't say a word. But when God gives him a message, he opens his mouth, he proclaims the message. And that's why, as we've already seen, he acts out a lot of his sermons. He's lying on his side all day, day after day. Then change the other one. What's going on? He's acting out the sermons. But Jesus says, soon you're going to be able to talk. So the people come, Ezekiel's wife is dead, they say, Ezekiel, why aren't you grieving? And then Ezekiel would give them God's message. God was going to take away the delight of the Jews. In the same way that God took away Ezekiel's delight, his wife, God is going to take away the delight of the Jews, their temple in Jerusalem. Be sort of like losing the Washington Monument for us in the U.S., or losing Big Ben for the British, or losing the Eiffel Tower to the French. Only ten times more so. Back in Jerusalem, Jeremiah was prophesying to the people, and he says, do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They thought, well, nothing can happen to us. We've got the temple here. We're God's people. We've got the temple. God would never let anything happen to his temple. That's our delight. In Sunday school, in the video we watched this morning, he said, very likely the temple was probably 21 stories tall. It was the focus of everything in Jerusalem. And so they thought, well, God is never going to let anything happen to the temple. But judgment was about to fall. So Ezekiel said that just as he did not grieve for his wife, so also the people would not be able to grieve for the fall of the temple. The Lord would soon defile the temple, slay the Judean children who are there in a siege at Jerusalem, and Ezekiel would be assigned to them. They were to respond to the destruction of the temple, the death of their children, in the same way that Ezekiel responded to the death of his wife. Just as the delight of his eyes was taken, so the delight of the eyes of the Jews, their temple, would fall. Why should they not mourn? Because Jerusalem's fall had been foretold time after time after time. So many of the prophets, including Ezekiel, had told the people, be sure your sin will find you out. Judgment should have been expected. God had been patient with them for years and years. But God finally reaches the end of his patience and judgment falls. So there's nothing to grieve over because the people have brought this judgment on themselves by their sinful actions. God tells them in verse 24, when this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. And as you read through Ezekiel, we find that phrase over and over and over again. In God, all of God's actions, he wants the people to realize there still is a God in heaven. What we saw in Ezekiel chapter 1, the vision of God. No, God has not forsaken his people. No, the Babylonians have, haven't conquered God. God still reigns supreme. And when this judgment comes, everyone will know that God is still in control. When the people of Israel failed, God said, I will destroy even my own witness on the earth. I want you to know that the city is destroyed. The rest of your people are being brought into captivity. But there's no use weeping. Don't come crying to me. Because I'm responsible for this. Because of your sins, judgment is coming. So God says that a messenger is going to come and bring the news of the fall of Jerusalem. That happens five months later on January 8, 585 B.C. A fugitive from Jerusalem came. You say, why does it take so much longer? Because he had to travel 880 miles to get there. Uh, but he comes, he shares the news, and when he does, God opens Ezekiel's mouth. And now Ezekiel can talk again. And as we go on in the book of Ezekiel, go Ezekiel goes on from messages of judgment, because now judgment has fallen, to give messages of hope. 
And as you go in through the end chapters of Ezekiel, you'll see Ezekiel giving pictures of a temple being rebuilt and the glory of God being reestablished, giving hope to the people. So, back to the events of Palm Sunday. Jesus comes to Lazarus' grave. As he is there, he gives a quiet, silent tear. In the same way Ezekiel has his wife die, he also sheds a silent tear. But for Jesus, the emotional outcome is yet to, to come. The disciples find a donkey for Jesus. They start making their way toward Jerusalem. Uh, he's been in Bethany, like here to the MacReady's house. And so he doesn't have far to go. Sometimes we think Jerusalem well, is so spread out, but really it's not that big of a city geographically. So he's traveling into Jerusalem. Everybody is starting to shout. Everybody, as they come over the crest of the hill of Mount of Olives, they look down. Here's the temple, this big 21-story building there. Their joy, their delight, it's been rebuilt. Uh, and everybody sees it, and they start celebrating. Everybody is focused on Jerusalem. But what is Jesus focused on? He's focused on the people of Jerusalem. His heart breaks and is overwhelmed with compassion. Uh, if you want to turn there, look in Luke 19.41. Luke 19.41. Jesus comes over the crest. He's not focused on all the beauty of the city. He thinks about the half million people who are there who are all going to be slaughtered. He knows what awaits them. Death and destruction. He knows that in just a few short years, the city will be razed to the ground by the Romans. A Roman general named Titus will set siege against Jerusalem because the Jews finally revolted against Rome. And according to the historian Josephus, over one million Jews are killed in that battle. So Jesus looks at the city and weeps. Here's what Luke 19.41 says. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. And sometimes we read this verse and we think, Oh yeah, he has a little silent tear. No, Lazarus, his good friend is dead. A small tear comes down. Here, as Jesus sees the city, this is the word for loud sobbing, violent wailing, Jesus is crying out with great emotion because he sees what's going to happen to the people in the city in the days ahead. And that's how great his love is for the people of Israel. He is visibly, emotionally moved to tears. Let's never forget that God passionately, desperately, completely loves the Jews. That's not a very politically correct thing to say in our day and age. Uh, with all the turmoil over putting our uh, embassy in Jerusalem, and think, oh my, well, how could you ever do that to the Palestinians? Doesn't God love them too? Yeah, God loves everyone, but the Jews are the apple of his eye. Psalm 122.6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Paul says in Romans 10, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. God longs to see the nation turn to Him. And they will one day when He returns. But so many will have died off by that time. Some people today like to say, well, you know, God, God's plan used to be for Israel, but now it's the church, and God cares about the church. God does love His church, but Scripture also tells us that the church is grafted in to the nation of Israel. We become part of spiritual Israel. So as the church, we really are spiritual Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 11.25 points out to us that God is still working out his plan for the Jews. It says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced 
a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So God is continuing to work out his plan for the Jews, for the nation of Israel. They're on hold right now because God's working with the Gentiles, but once the full number of Gentiles come in, then God's going to reinitiate his game plan for the nation of Israel. But we see Jesus, he comes, he looks at the city, and we see his heartbreak. And here is where Jesus wails, where Jesus outwardly, openly weeps. So what is our parallel in Ezekiel? What tears the heart of God apart? Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. We saw in chapter 24 that the Jews were facing judgment. The temple would be destroyed, the city would be burnt, the remainder of the people exiled, and God says, don't cry about it, you were warned, it's all your fault, I'm doing this. But now we see in chapter 34 how God feels about his people. Yes, they are facing judgment, but God desperately cares for them. The message here in chapter 34 is that God will care for his flock. And the Jews are described like a flock of sheep. Psalm 103 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. That's a verse we like to use a lot at Thanksgiving time. But initially it started as a verse for the Jews. But that same metaphor is used for the church, for Gentiles as well. In 1 Peter 5, we find these words. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So are the Jews the flock of God? Yes, they are. But is the church the flock of God? Yes, we are. So, God sees us as his flock, and God wants his sheep to get along. Ezekiel 34, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel, who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not care for the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals." My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. God has a message to his shepherds. Take care of my flock. The leaders of the Jews were focused only on themselves instead of caring about the people of the nation. In the same way, in the church today, we need leaders who care for the whole flock. As pastor, I always need to make sure that my focus is not in myself, but what's good for the whole church. Sadly, in churches, it can be easy for us to keep our focus and our attention and our priority on the areas that we enjoy, areas where we like to minister. So those thinking about missions can say, well, you know, God cares more about missions than anything else. But those working with children or youth can say, well, you know, these are the future of the church. And those working in music can say, well, you know, it's only through music that we really can give worship. And, and so many times people were in serving ministries, food distribution, well, you know, this is how we're the hands and feet of God to the community. And it becomes easy for us to focus just on our narrow piece of the pie. So what is the most important? The truth is that God cares about it all. 
That's like saying, which leg of a three-legged stool is the most important? Cut any one of them off and you are going to fall flat in your fanny. Each leg is important. And in the same way, God gives us a picture that in the church, in the body of Christ, every, every member of the body of Christ is important. Every member plays a part. 1 Corinthians 12, it says, As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So, as we look around the sanctuary, realize that each one here has a part to play in the body. You can't say, well, I'm more important than they are. They might be a little more important than me. No! We are to serve as one body, to serve as one unit. And sadly, not only does Ezekiel 34 point out the fault of the shepherds to care for the people, it points out the failure of the sheep to treat one another rightly. Ezekiel 34, look down in verse 17. As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another, and between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away, I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. The truth is that far too often we do not treat one another as we should. God's desire is that we love one another, care for one another, esteem our leaders in the highest regard, live in peace with one another. So in closing, let me give you four ways Scripture shows that we can love one another. We say, well, yeah, yeah, I love people, I love everybody, but practically, what does it mean to show love? <clears throat> Each of these four start with the letter H. The first one is harmony. When we love, we will live with harmony toward one another. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice what it does not say. It does not say that we need to live in agreement with everyone. That would be impossible. In our politically correct culture, we try to say, well, you, you can't tell a kid that they're wrong because that might really hurt their emotions. And so, anymore, no one is wrong, everybody's right. But you, can't, you can say 2 plus 2 equals 5, but it doesn't make it true. I'd be a fool to agree with you. But even if you're saying something untrue, I can still be at peace with you. I can still have harmony. I can still get along. The verse isn't about agreement as much as it is about harmony. We need to learn to get along with one another in peace. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul says, Be of one mind, live at peace. And that phrasing there is the same used in Matthew 4 when the disciples were mending their nets. We are to be tightly tied to one another. Far too often what happens is somebody doesn't get their way and they go their own separate way. But God's desire is that we be united to one another. Harmony. Satan brings strife to destroy the body of Christ. God desires we have harmony. It's one way we show love. The second expression of love comes through help. When we love one another, we help one another. Again, from the book of Romans, Romans 15, 1 and 2. 
we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. So in other words, we think not just what would I enjoy, but what would be a blessing to my neighbor, to my friend, to my brother, to my sister. Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So when you know of a brother or sister who has a need, pray with them about that need. Let them know that you're praying. Send them a card say, hey, just want to let you know you're still in my thoughts and prayers, and I am with you in this. If you need any help, call me up. If you need to talk, I'm there for you. We show that we care. 1 John 3.17 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And the answer is, it can't. It can't. God's love can't be in you if you see your brother has a need but you have no compassion for them. Don't just say, well, I'll pray for you if you can help them with a need. Because God is a God of compassion. And he wants us to to show compassion as well. Caring for others, expressed as we help one another. So we show love by living in harmony, being at peace. We show love by helping. Thirdly, we show love through humility. When we love, we will not be proud. Rather, we will think of others as better than ourselves. Philippians 2.3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. When you think about others, do you truly see them as better than yourself? Or do you say, well, I know I'm supposed to do that. They're not really better than me, but I'll try to treat them that way. No. The Bible says, esteem them that way. View them that way. Consider that that person is better than you. Because the truth is, they are. Because each person has an area where they are so much more light years beyond where we are at spiritually. But for one person, it might be in the area of prayer. One person might be in the area of faith. One person might be in the area of managing finances. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And so we can all learn from one another. We can all help one another. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So God exalts the humble and humbles the the proud. Then the fourth H is hospitality. When we love, we show it by opening our homes in love for one another. 1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. The key is that last phrase, without grumbling. You don't invite somebody for, over for lunch and then grumble, well, you know, these are pretty expensive steaks we're serving here. You know, I can't do that for everybody. If we're going to show hospitality, do it with the right attitude. And the truth is, it's far better to invite somebody over for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bless them and encourage them and be gracious to them than to invite them over for a seven-course dinner and complain and grumble the whole time. Don't just open your home, open your heart. Hospitality is not just about putting on a fancy show. It's about taking time to open your heart to hear of what's on that person's heart. And the meal is simply a, 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 an instrument, a, a way of getting to the heart. So as we think about hospitality, it's truly about the heart. Proverbs 23 is very graphic as it talks about hospitality. It says, Do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies. For he's the kind of man who's always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart's not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. So don't even bother going over for somebody who doesn't really want you there. Hospitality is about the heart. So here are four ways to show our love for one another in the church. Harmony, helping, humility, hospitality let's realize that god has created us to be passionate people none of us has any trouble loving the the problem is the question of what do we love or who do we love 
1 John 2.15 gives us a warning. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When we choose the love of the world over loving our brothers and sisters, it shows that we are not following God. 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Your brother may let you down, they may fail you, they may stab you in the back, but you can't retaliate. God calls us to love one another. But it's as we choose to love one another that God allows the world to see that he is in us. 1 John 4.12 No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. John 13, 35, By this all men you will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So when we love as we ought to, we show Christ to the world. That is our task as Christians, to live in such a way that others will see Christ living through us. Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Galatians 5.14, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, Palm Sunday, Jesus uh, comes, he sheds a silent tear for his friend Lazarus, but he knows that Lazarus lives again. In the same way Ezekiel's wife dies, he doesn't shed a tear as a message People, judgment's coming and you won't be able to grieve. But on Palm Sunday where Jesus outwardly wails is when he sees the people. Ezekiel 34, we see God's passion is that people care for one another. We get along, we love one another. May God help us this week to truly live out that truth as we show love one to another. Let's pray together. Father, we admit this morning that every single one of us here needs your help to show love as we ought. It's easy to show love for ourselves. It's easy to show love for our friends. It's easy to show love to those who love us. But Lord, we admit it's hard sometimes to show love to those who are cold, who are distant, who fail us, who hurt us, who wound us. But Lord, we know that is your call. And so, Lord, we pray that we would truly have a heart like yours to truly care for one another, to truly love one another. And as we show that love, may you be glorified and may our lives be a witness to the world that you are in us and with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us, please. We do give God praise for great things that he continues to do here among us and through us and in us.
And at this time, I'm going to ask Ron and Sue Mead if they would come forward. And one of the wonderful things that God is doing is bringing uh, attenders, part of our church family, to actually take the step of membership, to become members here at the church. Ron and Sue have come, and they offer themselves today to be members here at Bethel. If uh, you're a member and you would uh, uh, join me in welcoming Ron and Sue as members, say amen. 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 Anyone opposed to them joining? And there are none, so we welcome Ron and Sue into the church family. Make sure to come by and greet them afterwards. Let's have a prayer. Lord, it is a delight to have Ron and Sue as part of the church family here. Thank you for the way that you have used them to be a blessing already to so many. And we look forward to how that you're going to use them in the days ahead in the ministry of this church. Lord, we love them and we thank you for them. We ask your ongoing blessing upon their life. Now, we ask your, your blessing as we go our separate ways, and may we be used to be your light to the world this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See 